Sauropods are, quite frankly, some of the most incredible animals to have ever existed on our planet. To get to see one in real life, if only to attempt to take in their gargantuan size, is something many of us would give our right arm for. One such giant is a great example of such biological limit pushing, and that is Dreadnoughtus. Dreadnoughtus was first discovered in the Santa Cruz province of Patagonia back in 2005 by Kenneth Lacavara, who I kind of think sounds like Ryan Reynolds, link below. But it took a further four years to fully excavate, where the team extracted a partial maxilla, vertebrae, cervical and dorsal ribs, and most of the limbs, along with much of the same from a second individual. Thanks to the onset of 3D technology, laser scans were then used to provide a much clearer view of how the bones articulated, without having to move this incredibly heavy material around physically and risk it crumbling under its own weight. After a further five years of study, the new dinosaur was finally described by Lacavara in 2014, being crowned Dreadnoughtus scrani, with the genus name meaning simply, fears nothing. So as you might guess from this kind of name, this was a big boy. Dreadnoughtus is actually the most completely known titanosaur of its size as of recording this, with an unusually high level of preservation for such a huge animal. This titanosaur is a fairly close relative of the famous Argentinosaurus, having an especially long neck in comparison to the tail, and likely holding its head somewhere in between the horizontal posture of Diplodocids and the upright posture of Brachiosaurs. Another postural feature that set titanosaurs apart is what is known as a wide gauge posture, in which the limbs are still held underneath but sit more broadly than in other sauropods, likely to help with the phenomenal weight of a lot of these guys. In fact, Lacavara himself described Dreadnoughtus with its broad shoulders as one of the armoured Imperial Walkers from Star Wars. Paleontologists are such nerds, I love it. The shoulder height of Dreadnoughtus was around 6 metres or 20 feet, and the total length estimates for this sauropod comes in at approximately 26 metres or 85 feet. Despite the relative completeness of the animal though, there has been some controversy over the weight estimates. Many paleontologists have gone back and forth with different methods of weight estimation, ranging from simple femur and humerus circumferences to complicated calculations trying to take into account soft tissue and even the avian air sac system. These have given weight ranges of between 26 all the way up to 74 tons, which is quite the margin for error. The original researchers themselves gave estimates of around 59 tons, arguing that the more robust nature of the limb bones would simply be unnecessary if Dreadnoughtus fell into the lower end of those weight estimates, which I'll be honest, I'm inclined to agree with. Currently, as of 2020, Dreadnoughtus's average mass is estimated at around 48 to 49 tons. Given this and the amount of material found, Dreadnoughtus is actually the largest land animal of which we have such a high amount of material for. What I also haven't mentioned yet is that the material found from the holotype, which was actually the bigger of the two, actually showed signs that it wasn't done fully maturing, making this a subadult. Now this doesn't necessarily make Dreadnoughtus a huge amount bigger when fully grown, since reaching near to full adult size isn't uncommon before reaching full maturity, but it certainly is an interesting point to bring up when discussing this dinosaur's size. This also brings up some biomechanical obstacles when discussing any animal of this size, especially a land animal. There's the obvious question of supporting that kind of mass, which has already been explained, but also how sauropods of this size don't cook themselves. No, no seriously. Warm-blooded animals produce heat. There is also a little big thing known as gigantothermy. In very simple terms, an animal's body is performing a lot of different tasks, which takes energy. These processes and movements also produce energy in the form of heat as a byproduct. Now in smaller animals, or even ones that are around our own size, the heat produced from this alone is negligible at best. But when you're the size of Dreadnoughtus, the heat being produced by biological processes at this magnitude means that arguing whether it was cold or warm-blooded is kind of null and void. In fact, Lacavara himself has gone on record saying that the heat being produced by a body of this size internally would be enough to cook meat if it wasn't shedding heat. So how on earth was this thing shedding this much heat, especially at a time when Earth was so much hotter? Well, the most efficient and simple form of shedding heat is just surface area. Having that weight being as spread out as possible not only helps with balance, but also gives all the more surface for heat to escape through the skin. And who else does consistently better at surface area than sauropods? 
Those long necks and tails would have radiated heat out of the body that was also being carried around much more efficiently to be expelled by the avian air sac system. So it is now objective when I say that sauropods are cool. I'm too young for dad jokes. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the area that Dreadnoughtus was inhabiting and maybe find out why it got so big. The two specimens of Dreadnoughtus found were in the Cerro Fortaleza formation, a late Cretaceous deposit in Patagonia, Argentina, which dates to around 76 to 70 million years ago. This area at the time was a highly humid environment with regular rainy seasons, being rich in not only forests, but also plenty of river systems. These rivers are important here with regards to the preservation of Dreadnoughtus too, as this environment was very prone to flooding events during the wet season, either for revulsion events, or when a river retreats and then creates a new channel, or when the levee of the river is somehow broken and subsequently floods the surrounding area. In short, this constant flooding of the area is what we have to thank for when it comes to the exceptional preservation of such a huge animal. Sharing this environment with Dreadnoughtus was various freshwater bony fish and lambda-form sharks, Reptiles such as turtles and crocodilians, and whilst none have been directly found, it's highly possible that there was some sort of pterosaur presence here too. But considering that this is an area with the potential to preserve so much of Dreadnoughtus, which is really not easy for an animal of this size, the dinosaur material here is pretty poorly known. Indeterminate material has been found to belong to various titanosaur sauropods, abeliosaurids, and some possible spinosaurid remains. Specific genera named from this formation include ornithopods like Telencowen, theropods such as Ostrochirus and Orcoraptor, and fellow giant Poetosaurus. The South America has really got the lion's share when it comes to huge dinosaurs. But why is that? Well, uh, a couple of factors are at play here. Huge theropods can be fairly easily explained as a simple arms race to keep up with the growing size of the herbivores. But how this evolutionary arms race started is a bit more of a difficult question. Titanosaurs are relatively common in the Southern Hemisphere, so it's possible that irradiation started from Gondwana, and given that most dinosaurs have existed north of the equator, a lack of competition meant that this size grew without obstacles. Alternatively, this could simply be preservational bias, with orogenic events causing a lot of uplift and subsequent erosion after the Cretaceous in this area, meaning these bones are closer to the surface and easier to spot. Now if you want to know more about South American giants, I do have a video on that here going into more detail. And if you would like to know more about just how prehistoric animals got absolutely huge in general, I'll also leave a link for that. Let me know what you think of the content down in the comments, because your feedback is incredibly valuable to me. At worst, I can take on the criticism and improve the content, and at best it just makes my day. And whilst you're typing that out, I will answer today's question, which comes from... Hambone Bob, who's asked, Can you make a list of dinosaurs that you think tasted the best, and what dishes you'd make from them? Non-dinosaur animals are allowed too. Uh, you know what, this might not sound to many like a serious question, but I actually think it's a good one, so let's do that. Uh, also, if we did manage to bring back dinosaurs, eating them would be the last thing on my mind. But I am a massive carnivore and a barbecue lover. So I'm just going to go into this question without going into any of the other implications. So the tempting answer here would be to say, it tastes like chicken. Because, you know, bird equals dinosaur, you get the idea. But how a bird tastes ranges massively, and they even range in terms of white and red meat. Even if you just take one of those two groups, the meat tastes radically different. So considering this, it's almost impossible to say exactly what they would have tasted like but we can make a little bit of conjecture and some educated insights. First up, red or white meat? Well, what makes red meat red is a higher presence of a protein called myoglobin, which binds with oxygen to use as energy. The more consistently active a muscle is, the more myoglobin it uses and the darker the color, which is why chicken thighs are a little darker than chicken breasts because they're using their legs more. Alternatively, duck breasts are darker because those muscles are used for powered flight. So in turn, metabolism would also play a role here, since cold-blooded animals will often have white meat due to their lower activity lifestyles. Again, birds show that this isn't a hard and fast rule, but a warm-blooded and more active animal is more likely to have red meat than a cold-blooded one. A simplified explanation of this would be that slow-twitch muscle fibers contain more myoglobin, so muscles that are used for more sustained activities and have more slow twitch fibers are darker and fast twitch are lighter. So what did the non-avian dinosaurs have? 
Well, this is a difficult one. An easy answer would be that birds are dinosaurs and mostly have white meat, so why not the rest of the guys? Well, for anyone that's tried ostrich, this is a better platform to spring from, since ostriches are one of the most basal birds alive today, which have red meat. So long story short, I believe a general rule of thumb would be the bigger and more migratory the dinosaur, the more oxygen those muscles would need and so the darker its meat would be. But the smaller the dinosaur, the more likely it is to have white meat. Uh, back to the question, what would actually taste best? Well, it quite literally is a matter of taste. If you prefer beef or more red meat, I would look more towards the sauropods and ornithopods, since they have lifestyles that need more endurance than power. If you prefer white meat though, look more to the theropods, who would use more glycogen driven fast twitch muscle fibres for bursts of power but not as often. Don't forget as well, it also depends on what cut of meat it was. We don't know a huge amount about how dinosaurs would have stored fat, so it's tough to say what cut tasted like what, but my guess would be to follow the same sort of rules in that the limb muscles would be the toughest and darkest, the loin muscles would be the tenderest, and anything around the torso would be the fattiest and most indulgent like ribs the size of a shed. Uh, as for a specific dish, I have no other point of reference other than I like the names Brachius or Brisket, Velociraptor Vindaloo, Pachycephalus or Pie, Repeatosaurus Ragu. I could go on, but why not just put your ideas down in the comments? Anyway, thank you so much for submitting that. Uh, I don't know if I gave you a hugely specific answer, but hopefully I guided you towards your own. Uh, and to everyone else, thank you for watching this far. Please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and a subscribe if you haven't already. And I will catch you guys next time.